time to start. There's a signal for it. <laughs> you like me to like get some party poppers or something to begin, or like do a little like hello, welcome no. dance. <laughs> okay, so welcome everybody to Headset 101. This is actually our second uh, webinar of the Headset 101 series. The first one we did back in August. June, July, August, August. Um, and that was talking about uh, designing and deploying VR activations in the new world of, of COVID-19. And since then, we've actually designed and deployed a VR activation at the London Film Festival. So I figured this would be a wonderful time for us to come back and revisit this webinar with things we've learned from not just uh, saying it, but actually going out and doing it from that point onwards. Um, standard housekeeping, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or into the Q&A. Maybe if it's something that you want us to answer at the end or a topic you want us to raise, put it in the Q&A. If it's something you want us to pick up as we're going through. So it's something immediately relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, chuck it in the chat and we'll get to it as soon as we see it. Uh, if you have any problems, then just send, send me a message in the chat and I'll do everything I can to help you. Otherwise, I'm delighted to pass over to Verity who will be leading the webinar. Awesome. Um, yeah, so how we'll probably like run this format if it's all right with you guys is that I'm going to talk through. Sometimes I forget things. Um, so <laughs> Bertie might kind of intervene at some point as well and just kind of flag and say, hey V, what about this too? Because it'll probably be something really important and really useful for people to know. So um, a little bit about me. So if you don't know who I am, so I work in like a kind of XR, but really my background before any of this was events and event production, primarily corporate stuff. Um, but I do do some stuff within the arts and especially more so over the last few years. Um, but because I have a background in corporate events, um, I am fully IOSH trained. Um, so it's what the Institute of safety and health I think it is um so I can legally write risk assessments assessments apparently I am an inadvertent commas competent person um which is debatable at the best of times um I've delivered VR specific experiences to more than 10,000 people um across three continents so I've been super lucky to be able to do that for loads of huge name brands um, and also not just the brands, but the actual exciting projects as well. And the one thing that I am is I'm really passionate about the user journey. So we look a lot at UI or UX when it comes to the development of what goes on in the headset. But I tend to find that what happens is that people forget about the user experience for the deployment for the physical activation so um what their journey is from literally the first point of signing up registering whatever to going through to being welcomed getting on board here putting the headset on um going through the experiences guiding through that and then coming out the other side so the user journey for me is really important it doesn't start in the headset it actually starts well before as soon as they hear the name of the piece or the event or something that is happening so that's a little bit about me. So as Bertie said, we did a webinar back in August, um, which if you didn't see it might be good. I think it's available on YouTube. We can put the link out there um, where we went through the theory of everything. Obviously, I think we'd just come out of lockdown. We might have still been in lockdown at that point. Um, but that was very much kind of a theoretical activation and pretty much just said like we need to do better anyway the way that we're doing it at the moment doesn't really work so with kind of covid coming in we can make sure that we're looking at the whole user journey we're looking at the cleanliness we're looking at the start of training we're looking at all of these things um and we need to do better so it was kind of in a in a nutshell and please do go like watch me ramble on for like 45 minutes i think it was or an hour um, but we were looking at compliance and liability, which I think people weren't thinking of before COVID, where there was still compliance uh, and liability considerations that needed. We've all seen videos of people falling over, being made a fool of, someone 
someone touching someone while they're in a headset like that's your responsibility if you put that headset on them you shouldn't be letting people touch them even if they're staff members like a non-consented touch even in VR is just assault so that's been going on for a long time anyway I don't think people are writing their risk assessments properly which massively leaves you open to liability people weren't training their staff they were just giving them headsets and saying put it on it's dead easy or they were training them on troubleshooting the technical but not training them on how to interact with people how to keep people safe um we were saying obviously with keeping people safe now it's a lot more different because with covid we can't touch people um hygiene has always been a massive issue um grubby headsets is a thing i've had people offer me headsets which had just been disgusting and I know full well that they haven't been cleaned, like they still feel damp from the person before. Um, and communicable disease has always been a thing, but now obviously it's more of a thing. And people also think of the headsets, but they don't think of cleaning the controllers, which loads of people don't wash their hands. And I don't want to touch something that somebody else has just used. And I mean, this was pre-COVID anyway. So that's really important. And we also said, you know, check and protect your guests. So you would need to add a mechanism for track and trace. So that's kind of the theory behind what we said. Um, and we created this user journey, which was brilliant in my mind anyway, um, which was at the beginning, you have your guest and they arrive and they've got their mask on and whatnot, and you need to to get them to fill out some kind of questionnaire or embed that into the pre-coms so when they're registering you need that kind of uh, questionnaire in there have you been anywhere are you registered for track and trace yada 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 then the gloves and the headset then getting your setup right so because you can't touch people you definitely need to be able to see what's going on because you can't touch people you need a chair you need somebody guiding them as well that knows what they're doing um, the PPE sanitization and then cleaning everything at the end. So it was quite a sort of simple, straightforward user journey. And people asked for um, if there were any case studies at that point, which of course there weren't because we couldn't run these things. But then we got a phone call from the London Film Festival <laughs> Um, and we really had to put our money where our mouth was. I was like, yay, I professed myself to be an expert in this and now I have to actually do it. And hopefully it's, it's like quite a high profile um, installation as well. So to be fair, I was, I was really honored um, and kind of chuffed, but knew that we needed to do this right. So, um, the LFF expanded, so that's the London Film Festivals, um, it's the first year that they were running an XR strand um, and this was going to be the only physical installation of that new strand so it was really important for the client that we got this right as well and it felt nice and it had a really comfortable user journey as well as being safe. Um, so it was a brand new platform that we were delivering we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, it was going to be in one hour slots and we needed to get 500 people through it which was kind of daunting um that was across 10 days i think so they were like 50 people a day um which doesn't feel a lot in the old world even though it is 50 people for one hour we would normally have just chucked some headsets on them and kind of they'd have been fine and that would have been wrong anyway because that's not getting the most out of the user journey um but it was kind of a daunting prospect. So when we started looking at designing the user journey, which includes the, the physical installation, um, we had to look at what we knew. So, oh, sorry, this is the, the expanse. So we knew that the expanse was a social VR platform showcasing all of the chosen works, which is both three, uh, six DOF and three DOF. And it was being delivered using um, laptops and tethered headsets. And we knew that there was also a companion piece, which was an AR experience. And that was going to be um, in the form of a pop-up book that guests would look at through an iPad. So 
all of the stuff that we knew this is what you should do like at the very beginning is basically like compile everything into one <laughs> massive bundle of information that you can then slowly unpick and start to work out what the user journey needs to be and how you're going to facilitate that and how you're going to lay it out so that it's designed in a way that you know that kind of norman door design where you have a plate you know that you push it where you have a knob you know that you can pull it that's kind of where we have to start from so we knew that we were facilitating an AR and a VR experience in the same one hour slot. We knew that the kit that we would be using, which would be tethered laptops, headsets on the VR side of things, um, iPads and the book on the AR side of things. And we also knew the tech requirements as well. So we knew we were gonna need uh, power, we were gonna need a decent, because it's social we are, we were gonna need like a decent LAN thing, uh, LAN thing, um, a LAN connection. So we needed decent connectivity. Um, we knew the functionality of the works as well. And from looking at what the functionality of the works were, I think we needed to have a look or kind of guess what the user interaction was gonna be. So for this, I actually stuck my mate because it was the audience was like a variety of people. So there were some real industry people that came through, but because it was free to register, there were some people that had never tried VR before um, at all. So I stuck my mate in who was pretty much a novice when we had the first build and then just watched and see what she did so that we could anticipate how people were going to engage and how people were going to react so that we could then look at how we might be able to manage those behaviors like facilitate them but also help manage them to keep everybody safe without being able to touch them which was tricky um we knew what the venues covid protocols were going to be and how that was going to impact the guest journey and what we needed to do and that was really important as well so we knew that the bfi we're going to be you had to pre-register you couldn't even get into the building unless you pre-registered um there was the the host on the door so you basically had to show your ticket it was like a ticketed event kind of thing um everyone's temperature got taken on the way in and then they're also extremely strict around people wearing face masks in the building which is it's quite standard now at the moment um but we also knew that so people were gonna have to wear their face masks while they were enjoying the experiences and that's something we really had to consider too. We knew that we were in the current COVID, uh, we knew the current COVID guidelines uh, at the time, <laughs> it was tier one when we were in uh, London at the beginning of October, halfway through I think it was, we moved up to tier two. Uh, luckily, because we're so over the top about everything, we basically designed it so that you, you aside from it being like a pure lockdown, you'd be absolutely fine. But that's really something to consider though, because you kind of need like a plan A, plan B and plan C at the moment. Or if you can just, if you can plan it for like tier three or tier four, whatever the next one, but if you can plan it for the highest tier where it can still go ahead and then deliver it to that standard, um, and the whole thing be comfortable, then that kind of makes sense. So I would always always plan for that kind of worst case scenario. We knew the schedule that the space would keep, which was obviously really important around kind of getting people in and out and whatnot. We knew the space that we had, because obviously there are certain limitations. So with the power and whatnot, we you really have to be careful where you can put things because there are technical considerations as well as user considerations. Um, we knew that the whole, so the whole of the expanse, the whole of the um, platform that was developed, uh, the social VR platform that was developed for the London Film Festival, which hosted, I think there were like eight six off works and like 10 360 videos in there. And it was like a museum and you'd walk around. There was also a live theatre where people were live presenting from. There was like volumetric stuff, like a copy of the National Theatre. Um, all of that was delivered in three months, which is incredible. But also having deployed lots of these things, 
in the past, we knew that there might be some kind of troubleshooting on site. So we needed to make sure that when we're building this guest user journey, that actually there was going to be stuff that our people would need to do on the back end, perhaps, you know, stuff crashes all the time. So we need to make sure that they had good access to the kit to be able to restart stuff to see what's going on um, like a visual representation with the tv screen and whatnot um, because again the experience of kit crashing and someone not fixing it quickly for you or making you get out of your chair or moving you or something that really impacts on the user journey as well so because it was particularly a three-month build we knew that there was a higher likelihood that we would need to or the team would need to like text stuff quite regularly um but most of all didn't want to hurt anybody like always don't want to hurt anybody so we're using tethered headsets for a start so that means that there's a cable um a lot of this stuff is, is like the 360 and the six off and whatnot so people are going to try and move around they are going to try and spin around so just even with the cabling and whatnot was really important because we can't just touch them and go like, stop. And they've got headphones on. It's social VR. So we needed to take away their kind of auditory senses. So it was a real tricky one, really. Um, and, you know, that's even even just on the standard build of that kind of thing, because we now can't touch anybody. That was difficult. But also obviously COVID, like the massive COVID um, germ was potentially lurking around. So we obviously didn't want to hurt anybody because of that too. I don't want to kill anyone, dead simple. So this is the space that we built. So I'm going to run through the overall user journey like super quickly and then we'll go on to each individual part and we'll show you like how we manage those. So can you guys see the blue dot that's kind of spinning around? I don't know, Bay, can you jump on your camera and like wave and let me know if you can? No, I can see it. You can see it, perfect. It's quite rude not going on the camera quite rude okay so our guests so there was I think there was seven slots um for up to 10 people um throughout the day they were each an hour long and there was a half an hour turnaround time on the room so in the pre-coms in the email so once they'd signed up we sent an email out to them ex telling them um, exactly what to expect, what we were doing in terms of like COVID safety, like it will be sanitized. Obviously, as part of the caveat, it was like, if you have any symptoms, please don't come. Um, you'll be screened on the door. Uh, just managing people's expectations. And you can word this in a way that shows that you are, um, that you're obviously taking things seriously and you're, you guess to a certain extent, like showing them that you care about their well being and it's going to be COVID safe, but it doesn't have to be daunting at the same time. It doesn't, you don't have to use language which is like, do not do this, or really, you know, you can just say, you know, we're looking out for you. So, like, please do this, this, and this, and like, we'll do this, this, and this. And if you don't feel comfortable, talk to a member of staff. Um, so it started with the pre-coms, then we also asked them to arrive 10 minutes earlier and we gave them a space, which you can't quite see, it's just kind of like off the back, up the top. Um, I've just moved that over. But kind of you see where this like yellow thing is, that's the reception desk. Um, and we, we had a space that's just off the floor plan where people were able to sit in a queue and we were gonna have 10 people queuing tops. So they arrived supposedly on time, people are never on time. Um, and what would happen is we would get one of the guests, so they would move through from the, oh, sorry. I clicked to try and get the blue button back. There we go. So we would get people, so they'd be queuing off over here and then we call them up one at a time. We got the call sheet, so we'd just check them in, be like, hello, welcome to this and this. This is what you're gonna see. Um, if you could uh, just head through to this space here where we had 10 chairs set up and we'd ask them to take a seat. 
we had some information along this back wall so if they wanted to have a quick browse about what they might be seeing um they are more than welcome to do that but all of these chairs were socially distanced um, and we would ask people to wait. There was a nice projection on the wall, so it wasn't too boring for them. And we'd also ask them if they, because there was a limited amount of time as well. So we'd say, you know, you've only got so long in the expense. So if there is anything, um, maybe have a quick look. If you haven't already looked at the works that you particularly would like to see if you need to prioritise your time. So within a couple of minutes, like five minutes, when we have like one or two people at the front, just checking people in, people would generally tend to come either on their own or groups of between like two or three so it wasn't a particularly laborious task everyone managed to be socially distanced getting them in and then one of our team would deliver a quick briefing so this was in our head it's like a quick briefing it's an onboarding thing but to them it was a nice welcome so we'd be like hey like welcome to lff expanded like my name's whatever, um, my, my name's Verity, obviously. Um, but yeah, this is what you're gonna see. Um, we have a number of people around, but housekeeping, if you can keep your masks on, if you don't feel well at any um, any time, give us a shout. Fire exits are over here, yada, yada, yada. Um, but then just kind of like, so literally like a quick four minute talk not even, it probably lasted about three minutes actually, um, which was pre-written, it was pre-scripted. So it really felt like a welcome. And then we'd normally got the other staff who were there as well, standing kind of like, oh, this is such and such, and this is such and such. So it just instantly relaxed people. Obviously we were all wearing masks as well. All the team were all wearing masks at all times too. Um, so from there, rather than getting 10 people, we had three members of staff manning this space, and um, by the way. Um, so rather than getting everybody onto these spaces here, which are the pods, which I'll talk about the pod design sort of shortly, um, we would send five people over here to get into VR, and then we would send five people over here to go into AR into the aqua alter experience so one person would look after these five and then two people would look after these guys over here so once everybody had gone through anything we pull these guys off as well they'd go into the ar as soon as they were finished on there these guys are normally finished on boarding so they could help on board and kind of get people in over the other side so that was really important like just considering how many members of staff can actually talk people through putting on a headset and navigating a new system that they haven't used and whatnot. And we found that splitting them up, like you could probably onboard between two and three people as one person if they're close together at any point, but everyone has different needs. So that can get quite tricky at times. Um, the guys at Virtual Umbrella, all their staff are amazing. So that, that helped a lot because they know their stuff. But yeah, so just a super quick talk about the AR things. I know we're here for like the VR side of things. There's um, Bertie and that was Ulrich, who was the, um, the oh, what did they call it? The programmer, the, who was the boss. Programmer, curator. The curator, that. there you Creative go. Brain. <laughs> it was like the creative brain behind it all. Um, so we had this experience, which is at the front, which was called Aqua Alta, Crossing the Mirror. So it's a VR pop-up book. Um, we knew that this would be slightly easier to manage um, because all we had to do is basically provide a space that a number of people could walk through at one time. They were using iPads, so we just had to make sure the iPads were sanitized in between. And again, that was easy. We knew exactly what to do with that. So we bought a UV cabinet and we kept all of the iPads and the headphones in the UV cabinet. And we would constantly kind of, as soon as somebody, um, a session finished, um, we would switch the UV sanitization unit on so that as people were coming out, they wanted to go on the Aqua Alta, they would straight from the UV cabinet get their own headset and their own iPad. They weren't touching anybody else's. They were doing that, they went round, they saw everything, they could be socially distanced and then it went straight back in. So our staff did not have to touch anything. There was like no contamination point. It was brilliant and so super easy to manage as well. 
um, they were literally kind of self-sufficient. And that's what I mean with like the Norman door design. If you can make people as self-sufficient as possible by pre-planning those steps into it but then it still felt it just felt normal and natural it didn't feel like oh no we can't touch that it was just like oh if you can just take one of these from here and then people were like yeah cool sure what is it and then we'd explain and they go oh, it's quite nice we feel safe and um, so that bit was super easy uh so then this is oh this is just a picture of like the onboarding as we were going, I am not a photographer and this was the only image <laughs> that I also had, but it actually acted as a great place um, that people could leave their bags and coats as well. And quite a lot of people chose to do that. We'd got security either side. So nobody was going anywhere with anything. There was like at least kind of three or four of the BFI staff in there. It's like three or four security guards as well, but it just helped to let people just leave their stuff because again I think that's one thing that we forget when we're designing VR activations is that people bring stuff with them they have a coat they have a bag and then we sit them in a space and then we make them put their coat and bag on the floor or whatever which is a a massive trip had but also a trip has it but it's also a contamination issue as well so yeah that's a quick picture of the onboarding and then on to the good stuff <laughs> so this is the um the vr pod so this is a picture of like the vr space that we created so if you have a look up here these were at the back of the room and these pods the one and the two so oh, sneak preview um these pods sit five people so again talking about the functionality of the expanse so we knew that um we well we knew that it was a vr experience we knew that it was going to be run off a tethered headset so tethered headset means cables so if you've got six stuff stuff and you're using tethered headsets please make sure that you're not going to grow anybody we've all seen people be tangled in cables so if you can see here this is where the aperture was in the pods um, we had enough slack on there and also you can see there's like a member of staff around here and this is kind of being being visually viewed so first off make sure you've got that second as well with the audio um, so if you've got your headphones on or whatnot um, you need to obviously be able to communicate with them that you can turn your headphones up and down and what you can do with that but also there's it's another cable um, we avoided the Bluetooth headphones, um, even though cause those were Bluetooth as well, but just understanding what we would need to do, the amount of staff that we'd got and the tech, it was like if we accidentally, for whatever reason, and you'll see shortly how we could potentially do this, mix up the headsets, repairing 10 pairs of headsets after we've had to sanitize everything was going to be a bit of a nightmare so we wanted to eliminate that and that's why we use the cable um if you have fewer maybe headset um bluetooth might work better for you but you know it's it is what it is um we knew that so we got six off and three off um and quite a lot of the three off stuff was like full 360 video um, which actively encouraged you to look around like this guy here not facing the screen like at all so we knew that we needed swivel chairs really simple um but we needed swivel chairs and we needed enough space to be able to um to allow them to swing around with the cabling now this is where it is super tricky because we can't touch anybody <laughs> which is really hard and we can't take the headset off them and just have a quick look in and reset stuff and whatnot so this screen was like super important so um obviously we've got kind of the laptops and whatnot inside here but our techs at any point would be walking around there's cassie she's great she was walking around and she can instantly spot if there's a problem instantly see if there's an issue there or if someone's stuck against a wall and then they could verbally communicate to people. There was a lot of, hi, hi, 
hi, now, excuse me. And then people would be like, oh uh, yeah. <laughs> and then you could walk them through it verbally. First couple of times that was kind of tricky, but obviously 10 days of these guys doing it, they really knew everything and they can pretty much say it in their sleep and probably still could now. And then we've got plenty of space around here, again, for people to put their bags. Someone's got their bag down there if they wanted it. They've got the coats on the back of the chairs. Um, we've also got, you might be able to see here, and there's one here. So on all of the pods, there were wipes. Um, so we had the wipes there for two reasons. Um, first reason being for comfort levels of people that were coming in. So if they were slightly uncomfortable um, with the seat, you know, always please feel free to use the wipes whenever you need. If we did, which we did occasionally need to put our faces in the headsets to have a quick look, if we did need to do that, then we could make sure that we were sanitizing our hands before putting them on, sanitizing the headset afterwards, and the guests were also invited to do that to make sure that there was no transmission between us. We looked at using gloves. Gloves are incredible if you know how to use them. If you don't know how to use them properly, like does anyone know the correct way to take off a pair of gloves after you've used them so that you don't contaminate anything? Um, but there is like a correct technique. If you, if you don't know that, if you're not training contamination processes, do not use gloves because you are more likely to introduce something awful thinking that you're safe. The best thing that you can do is constantly like have your staff sanitizing. They're all wearing, um, they're all wearing masks, but constantly sanitizing their hands. You get really dry hands and it ruins your nail varnish, but it is so much better like I genuinely thought last time when we spoke the gloves were a good idea but after speaking with a contaminations expert he was like no no just do not do that at all um so yeah the, the other final consideration that we actually had with this which isn't a COVID thing I mean obviously that socially distanced I should have said that it's like it's just rule number one they have enough space um, but also because it was a social VR thing as well, we needed to make sure that they could communicate. So they're going to be talking with people from everywhere. And we didn't want the sound to bleed across the two sides. Um, well, there's five sides altogether, but across the between the booths, we didn't want the sound to bleed. So what we did is we backed, we first curved them so that obviously any sound waves are gonna bounce kind of more back into the room, be kind of isolated rather than just going off anywhere. But then we also felt them as well because that's like a really absorbent. And I think that helped loads because we were able to actually run a few of the, I think we ran the welcome where there are a number of different people talking and although they were talking to each other across the room, there wasn't any sound bleed between the individual pods, which was super helpful, super, super helpful. Um, and for anyone that's ever teched anything, we knew that we got really limited staffing. So we, there were three staff. So those three staff were cleaning everything in between and we'll get onto how that worked shortly, the turnaround time, but they were also guiding everybody through it and they were teching at the same time. So it would be absolutely pointless having the laptops all over the place. We literally wanted one tech at a time to be able to walk in and do three, like, like troubleshoot perhaps like three different laptops at the same time or all five, if you have almost like octopus hands. But again, because that's like a massive part of the guest journey, because I mean, I've I'm not only delivered, but I've also been there when techs failed. And it's really frustrating when everyone else around you is having a really nice time and you're like, this is cool. This is just me sat here by myself, not being able to do anything. And because we had limited time, um, it was really important that we were able to, if anything did go wrong, just turn it around really quickly. I think you might be able to see that we were probably downloading updates as well at the time because stuff was constantly needing to be updated. So this worked really well. Everything was connected through a router at the bottom. Obviously no daisy chaining, so no fire hazards. We weren't gonna kill anybody that way because it's always good to not kill people. But yeah, when you're designing experiences, think about making it easy for the techs as well. 
because I think we quite often forget how to do that. Um, and the text, if the texts are the ones that are guiding the user experience, that's going to directly impact the user experience as well, because we all know what it's like when you get frustrated, stuff's failing, and then it's like you kind of go out with gritted teeth, like, yes, oh my gosh. And especially if they're someone who's slightly more challenging to talk through what they need to do, um, if you make the text life difficult. It's just, it's not good for anybody. So let's have a quick chat about room turnover. So this is, you know, all of that other stuff is really nice, having soundproof pods, everyone being socially distanced, it's still being a really lovely, enjoyable experience. You can see it was a super lovely, well-lit room, but realistically, once people are in their chairs, that's fine. If they bring COVID in with them, which they shouldn't have done because they've been checked at the door, they've been told don't turn up if you have symptoms. Yeah, they've had their temperature taken, they're wearing masks, we've given them sanitization stuff. Um, we've got them to sit down, they're not interacting with anyone, we're not touching them. Um, but if someone did walk in with COVID or contaminated with COVID, this is like the critical point. So this is that we had half an hour in between sessions to turn the room around. So anything that we did with the space design, it really, this, this was everything. Like this was absolutely everything. So what we did, people get kicked out the back door then all of these guys who are li lying on the floor, I think I think that might be Sammy Kingston at the back, um, just doing some sort of like day one and day two troubleshooting. But these three people who were working in there pretty much all the time would head round, grab the headset, there's a headset there, and their headphones and the controllers don't forget the controllers because controllers are gross like hands are probably grosser than faces faces might be slightly more deadly at the moment but hands are gross so they would go around disconnect everything put them as one into these units here so you'd have pod one there pod two there pod three there pod four there pod five there pod six there they developed this really great system so that they knew which bit of kit came from which pod. So that we just found that that worked better. So that if we're constantly unplugging stuff and plugging stuff back in, it tended to just be a little bit easier to remember the headset. It was like, oh no, I know this headset. That's cool. This is, this is how we're running it. So we're going to the UBI sanitization unit. While that was in the sanitization unit, which I think took not very long, it was a few minutes to do, um, to like in inverted commas, microwave all 10 headsets um, and controllers so 20 controllers 10 headsets 10 sets of headphones sanitize all of that while that was happening these guys would each get their dental sprays out they would go they would fully spray uh, wipe over first then spray all of the chairs all of the touchable surfaces in the area they've anti back their hands they're covered in anti back by this point as well and um, just to say that these guys were temperature checked every morning when they came into the building too. So if there had been any issues with temperatures or anything like that, that would have been flagged quite quickly. Um, so yeah, they would go around, they would absolutely spray everything, then they would go and retrieve everything with their hands still fully sanitized, always with their masks on and whatnot. So they would go and retrieve everything, replug everything back in, <laughs> another quick spray over. Um, and then they would dive into the booths. Um, oh, actually, one thing about the staffing too, these guys formed a bubble because we were down for 10 days. So they actually formed a bubble during that time so that they were living together as well, so that they were able to not necessarily have to maintain as much social distancing. So when they're teching stuff, um, it just made it a lot easier to run it that way rather than having kind of strangers having to also socially distance at the same time so I would highly recommend that get an Airbnb put everyone together bubble them um, um, just to add on that it's also loads cheaper if you're bringing people into <laughs> London it's so much cheaper than a hotel it's just to put everyone in a big Airbnb together yeah, yeah not just in London also like other places exist as well I'm proud Brummie um, 
but yeah so the, the airbnb thing bringing people into a bubble worked wonderfully so yeah well when, once they plugged everything back in one person would jump in there one person would jump into the other pod and they'd literally just close it restart it someone would be out here as though everyone was restarting all the laptops just like yep yeah, that's okay yep yeah, that's okay yep yeah, that's okay and then we were done and they could literally turn that room around fully sanitized within about I think it was about 10 minutes by the end of it it was amazing um and then that way that we knew that when the next load of people came in like I mean it stank of anti-bag but it was quite nice because it was the Dettol spray one which was really lovely um but we knew it was safe we knew it was safe we knew there was very little chance of contamination and I just wanted to talk about the staff like so these guys whilst we look like complete idiots I mean I'm not in that picture I took that picture because I realized that Cassie had a pink water bottle and everyone was in all black and then this is a BFI staff member that walked in he was game to lie on the floor and have fun but we knew we got three staff because that's what the budget allowed and we it's a lot of people to turn around and guide new platform lots of stuff going on people need a lot of hand holding different levels of experience plus covid like that's a lot so when um virtual umbrella looked at picking the staff i was working for the bfi at this point so i was directly contracted with the bfi but when i spoke with sammy um at virtual umbrella was like we need the staff yada 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 um, we need a team, which is quite, <laughs> I, I feel bad. I'm really sorry, Sammy, if you're on here, I feel really bad. Cause it was like, we need some people that know about film because obviously this was the first year delivering the LFF expanded. So if we put people in that didn't know anything about film whatsoever, that was just going to be ridiculous because it's part of the London Film Festival. So I was like, so we need some people that know about film. Um, we also need them to be technical and to be able to troubleshoot um, a really complicated brand new social VR platform that no one's ever used. And by the way, we got the final build like 12 hours before we had to go live. Um, so we need someone that can tech all of that as well. And we also need people who are fully COVID compliant, really good communicators, really great at front of house and can guide an experience um, from novice level to like the experts and people from the industry and be able to communicate with them on all levels. Um, and she actually managed to do it, which is incredible. So like Cassie has worked on loads of VR projects. That's Cassie down there. But she's also a massive film fan. So that was brilliant. Um, Saf is in the middle. So Saf's worked on VR stuff for the West Midlands Fire Service. So he's like a contaminations expert as well. And then there's Connor at the back, who Connor is a tech whiz and has been doing VR stuff for like quite a long time. Um, he's, he's teched loads of stuff and all three of them are brilliant at front of house as well. So don't just get anyone. Like it's literally... The difference that I had so many it was so lovely because like obviously designing a space designing how everything is going to work in terms of flow and users and how people are going to interact and engage with it is one thing but if people don't meet you with a smile which can be really hard when you're in quite a demanding work environment after say like a <laughs> sometimes 10 hour shift um, and it, at one point, I'm super lucky, and so we were using AWS servers. Um, only issue that we had, like only technical glitch that we had is the servers went down. So, so at one point we had 20 minutes where nothing was working. Um, and it's really important that you've got good staff there. Um, especially we had a few people who were worried like about COVID so people could talk through exactly what we've done exactly the steps that we've taken and we could communicate it but also <sighs> guiding people so having people that are like proactive enough to be able to say hey I think you might need some help like I can help you how about we just do this this and this um they are lucid enough with their language as well to be able to describe complicated stuff when someone you know when someone's really frustrated and I think we've all done this when you are 
in a new VR experience and you don't really know what you're doing and then someone's giving you instructions and it's all just a bit frustrating because you can't do it and normally you just take the headset off them you just take the controllers off them and be like yeah I just do it like you can't really do that now um we had to do it a few times in really extreme cases but it's better that you just don't so getting people who are really effective communicators and able to give really clear instruction is brilliant and and be nice at the same time as well even when you're like oh my god that person's such an idiot like these guys were so nice it was brilliant so yeah staff is everything um we were able to train them really really well on the covid side of things but because we didn't get the platform until sort of the final platform until 12 hours earlier i wish we'd have had the build before then um because there was a little bit of learning on the job for them um in that respect and it would have been a lot easier if we'd have had it but these things happen these things happen so yeah i was really proud of them like super proud but staff staff at everything so our success measures we didn't kill anyone <laughs> <laughs> like really important it's why we waited so long um because we were just um yeah just taking the time to check what had actually happened um and make sure that nothing had come back there were no cases or anything um i think from that the second amazing success measure every single person who came through went on the vr and participated um which was great there was one woman that came through um, she was pregnant and she was clearly terrified um, and she went on it. It was fine. We just, she requested to be moved one booth over because she was next to somebody for the onboarding process. It was easier. I mean, they were still two meters apart. The person that was onboarding them was another two meters away, um, but she just didn't feel comfortable. So we were like, okay, it's going to take a little bit longer to get you on. But if you move around to there and then someone will come over to you in a second. And just explaining to people that you know this is the way it works but if you need something different we can do that and that worked fine she had a great time and went off um the staff were really tired uh because it was really long shifts um and there was a lot to do a lot to think about but they did amazingly amazingly well and yeah finally we were all really proud because we had really great feedback and primarily like the feedback again and this is the really important thing I think like the feedback for the platform was amazing but every single time people would mention the staff at the same time and I think we forget sometimes when we're designing and delivering like any kind of XR installation that yes the tech is really important but if you have any people assisting with it they are just as important because the experience inside the tech can be incredible, but if the person, excuse my French, is an arsehole that's guiding them through it, that's going to completely ruin everything. So, like, yeah, we were proud of the staff, proud of the layout. It worked well. People kind of just sort of knew what to do to a certain extent, even when we had people waiting um, in their chairs for like a minute while they were waiting for someone to come around. They were comfortable. And, yeah, um, I am proud of that. I was super proud. So do we have any questions? I haven't looked at the... Hello. Um, ah. <clears throat> we don't have any specific questions unless people would like to add anything now. Ah, we have one from Hoken saying, did you consider using UVC lighting clean boxes for the disinfection of the headsets? Yeah, so that box that we had, let me go back. Um, we had, there we go, you see that one in the corner? So we had two of those. So they were like a key part of the process. So we had one that was at the front that people would get their iPads from for the augmented reality experience. And then we had one in here, which we microwaved all of the headsets, the headphones um, and the controllers in in between every every use so yeah they were they were a key part of the process um i personally wouldn't have been comfortable just using disinfectant and i think the guests really like to see that as well um it is better at the moment to 
perhaps overdo things and be quite performative about what you're doing because it's not being performative in a way of like oh yeah look we're amazingly clean it's like you can trust us like we genuinely care these are all the steps that we've taken and then once you've got that people will just relax into the experience so yeah having the uv side of things as well as the physical spray disinfectant was everything yeah i wouldn't have done it without them at all you got any more to add to that bit um no i think you've covered it i think the uv san uh, uv units that were used the cabinets it wasn't just the actual technical or scientific fact that it destroyed the vaccine destroyed the vaccine sorry destroyed the virus it doesn't destroy the vaccine <laughs> we hope it doesn't destroy the vaccine oh no um so they actually visually reassured people a lot of the time uh when we had people coming through we'd say to them we're using these ultraviolet cabinets and they and they'd be like oh that's amazing that's that's so smart that's really good to see and it's almost a it's all it's as much the the theatrics of putting it into this unit that lights up blue when it's uh, sanitizing the headsets it's that shows that it works and i think that puts people at ease as much as scientifically knowing it works yeah i think i think that's that is super important and as well obviously like we had money to spend on this installation so we had the booths custom built and if anybody does need the booths um they are available for hire so the company that we use like give us a shout so the company that we used to build them they went in onto the back of a truck um and they are they're somewhere in a storage warehouse so if you do have a physical installation that you need something to go in but obviously like you can see we recarpeted everything this was the blue room at south bank bfi south bank i don't know if you've ever seen it but it looks very different from this um so obviously we had a reasonable budget to spend um but if you don't actually having one of these units because they're really like because they shine blue and that oh, it, it just looks really cool as well which i think adds to the whole user journey because the aesthetic is is important it's better not to have just like a chair in a room get a nice chair yeah um as well if it's of interest to anyone the people at uvsat have actually provided us a discount code which gets you 250 quid off if you purchase any UVSAN units. So I'm going to be doing a, a follow-up email saying thank you for attending or everyone who's not here, how dare you for not attending. <laughs> and that, that email will include the, the discount code and the instructions how to do it. Um, I think the units were, I think the unit was about 4,000, 3,000 pounds, something along that. Uh, so this is 250 quid off. So just under 10%. Yeah, they, they are good. Um, obviously, like sprays and whatnot as well. But I would say, like, honestly, my biggest takeaway from this is design good hygiene practice into, into the, the customer journey. So don't think, think about your guest journey. Think about it outside of the headset. Think about it coming into the headset. Think about how it looks as well when you're on site because you can do things that are more aesthetically pleasing. And also if people, if people see a wipe on the side, they will take a wipe on the side. If you put it at eye level and at hand level, like people will take it. Um, and yet there was not one, I see Rich, Rich Lloyd, hi, has put about the... Uh, the sweaty headsets yeah it's disgusting it's disgusting or like I wear quite a lot of makeup so like I feel bad for people if I'm taking it off and then I've just like covered the headset in makeup as well um so yeah making sure you physically wipe over as well is just super important so yeah oh oh no one thing before you all go risk assessments um comp in inverted commas competent person now Risk assessments, super important. If anything goes wrong, your insurance is entirely invalid. Um, with this, I was a member of BFI staff. I was contracted directly with the BFI. Um, so I can't share the direct risk assessment that I did because technically it's their IP. But um, I just wanna let you know that I created a specific 
risk assessment for COVID. There was one which was your usual trips and falls and whatnot. And risk assessments, they seem really boring, but actually when you walk through the space in your mind that you've created to identify all of the hazards, that is really helpful for the design because you might be like, oh, actually someone could do this. So what do I need to do as my method statement to be able to eradicate that risk and make it a, a better user journey? Um, so yeah, if anyone needs a copy example of a risk assessment, um, give us a shout. We can probably get one over to you. Obviously, we can't do a site-specific one. We can't have our names on it because you have your static risk assessments, which you do before, and then you'll have a dynamic risk assessment that you do on site. Um, but yeah, risk assessments are everything because you're legally viable. And also have a look at your insurance just double check what your insurance is saying around COVID at the moment. Again, I didn't have to worry about that so much because that was with the BFI. But if you're deploying anything, um, if you're gonna have to insure it or you're, it's gonna fall on your public liability insurance, check what it says around COVID. Um, just because if you don't have that paperwork in place, you can land yourself in a real pickle, real big pickle. Wonderful, cool, and thank you for adding that. Um, <laughs> up and safety. <laughs> up and safety, exactly. The last thing we want is our insurance to be completely null and void. Uh, I will maybe hold off for one more minute in case there's any other questions. Uh, they can be on topic, they could be off topic. You could ask Verity about whatever that is in the background. Is that like a, a canvas or a mural on the wall? Yeah, so I just want to actually say thank you because I had to get a plane today. Um, I'm in Belfast at the moment, so I'm in a jewelry's in in Belfast because I am going to Rimbargo, so we can't really say much, but both Bertie and I are putting vulnerable individuals in VR headsets um, as part of an advertising campaign, which is going to be for Christmas. Um, so yeah, I'm stuck in Belfast by myself and this is my hotel room. So thanks for saying, hey, I had to get a plane and everything. It was really weird and grim and the airports were dead. Was Rich hot. has said, uh, if they kept their masks on, did you find they got too hot or steam up their headsets? Weirdly, um, everyone did keep their masks on because that was, again, it was part of the onboarding process. They were told beforehand they'd have to do it. They were told when they got into the building, they would have to do it. And then they were told during the briefing that they would have to do it. And again, how we put that was basically like, you know, this is a COVID safe environment. So if you could keep your mask on at all times so we can keep everybody safe, that would be brilliant. Um, so framing it like that rather than keep your masks on, otherwise we'll kick you out. The impact, the reality was if they did take their mask off, then we would have to ask them to leave um, unless they were exempt from wearing one. Um, but we would have known that because someone else was checking that on the way up. But if they came in with a mask and they took it off, then we would have had to politely ask them to pop it back on. Um, weirdly, whilst it steams up glasses, did not seem to steam up the headset in any way, shape or form. Um, occasionally felt a little bit claustrophobic when you first went in. Um, we had extra, the blue head mask, face masks as well, because they're a bit more breathable in case anyone had any of the nylon ones or whatnot. Um, but no, there was weirdly no steaming issues, just more like overwhelming. So you've got like heads up, heads up, heads up. Yeah, uh, regarding steaming up as well, uh, one trick which we've learned, if you do have a lot of headsets steaming up, it's something that the uh, the RAF used to do actually is washing up liquid. So if you get a little a little spot of washing up liquid, put it on like a, a dry wipe uh, cloth mm. and then rub that into the lenses, that stops uh, condensation. So you can use that to as a cheap, fast fix for minimizing uh, fogging up. Yeah. And microfiber cloths, you should always have like massive packs of them because we would, if we'd use them one day, then we would change them the next day and we would, we, they'd basically be washed in between. Um, even though we were wiping them before we went into the headset, but yeah, always make sure that you're wiping the lenses because has anyone like put on greasy lenses or picked up an iPad and it's been greasy? Like microfiber cloths are the best. And if you can get them in the colors of the space that you're doing rather than just a general pack, 
that's even better but that's because I'm a branding queen but it, it does it it adds to the aesthetic so yeah any any more questions guys we've got nothing else coming in so I think I think this is a good time for us to say thank you amazing I guess <laughs> Thank you for keeping me company otherwise i'd have just been sat here doing emails and whatnot although because i'm in belfast like i don't know where everybody else is but weirdly there are shops open and stuff so i might just walk into a shop because uh, where i live in birmingham no shops are open at the moment we're still in full lockdown um but yeah thanks for coming if you do think of any questions afterwards give us a shout drop us a note um so i am on twitter Oh no, I didn't. I totally, I totally got rid of it. But my handle's at Verity Nally because um, I'm creative in some ways and not so much in any others. Um, but you're Bertaru. You still Bertaru? I I'm Bertaru on every single social media platform. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, drop us a note or send us an email, and we'll help in any way we can because we we believe in this technology and we want everybody to do better. So just give us give us a shout if you need any advice or have any ideas and any advice for us as well, which is it's a two way thing, isn't it? We all need to share. Exactly. Cool. Well, thank you so much to, to all of you for taking the time to to attend and to listen today. If you do have any questions which wake you up in the middle of the night, which you need answering, our contact details will be on the follow up email. Uh, and yeah, otherwise, have a lovely evening. Thanks again. Goodbye. <laughs>